Make sure you have your questions ready because she will be taking a few Q&As uh, after she uh, makes her way to the stage. But without further ado, I want to bring on Miss Cindy Lauper as she prepares for the record launch of Detour.
He was also his five. And um, he made that track come alive. And between him doing Detour, and then we did You're the Reason, Our Kids Are Over It, which when I was growing up, everything, you know, country music was funny. It was funny, it was soulful, and there was a time when country music and soul and R&B walked hand in hand. Around the time before and after Elvis Presley kicked the doors in, and that's what so says Seymour Starr. So I went with that. Um, but he's right. And that's why some of the songs I chose, like Misty Blue, which was a hit in 1962 with Wilma Burgess, and then 10 years later was a hit with Dorothy Moore, shows how close those two genres really are. So, that's not really the long and short of it yet. I can make it much longer. Also, <laughs> um, you know, I, I had the pleasure of meeting Emmy Lou Harris way before I actually started the album, and I had come down here before and spoken with her, and you know, she actually cooked me dinner. We <laughs> ate dinner at her house. I couldn't even believe it. You know, I was trying to go gluten free at that moment, but you know, she had this kind of African stew, had a little weed in there, but I didn't care because it was <laughs> Emmy Lou Harris, and then you know. She made like a refrigerated cake. It was something like that. I wasn't going to say no. It was her. So I had a little piece and, you know, but I was fortunate enough to have her come and sing on Detour. I kind of knew that she was right for that and it would be fun. And if she ever puts that band together where women go on the bus and travel, I'm in. And that's how we started talking, except I want to film it. Because, right, would you want to see what goes on, right? Bunch of divas in a bus, come on. Right? So um, anyway, so from that conversation, it kind of spilled into us doing this record with Seymour, and then she came and sang on Detour. And then, of course, Willie Nelson, that was a trip. But amazing, amazing. This is the man that wrote 300 songs, you know. Of course, Loretta Lynn, she wrote a lot of songs in her life one too. Um, and uh, I just felt, well, I waited for him in the front, because, you know, I had to be, I was welcoming everyone that came, and, you know. and uh, he came in the back, of course, with the bus, the legendary bus. I don't know if you guys, yeah, maybe you know. So they invited me on the bus and I couldn't go because I had to work, you know, and I was worried about, you know, like falling asleep and waking up in Austin, which is a good adventure, but not right for what I was doing. So, you know, I said no, and I kind of felt bad a little, you know, but, but he was great. And he sat down and seeing nightlife, when I heard nightlife, it's such a great melody and such, it's just a beautiful song and simple. And, you know, of course, when you first start singing it, you know, every bad jazz riff goes in there and you realize you don't have to put anything in. It's already there. It's all just back off and singing simple, you know. And he, he loved what we did. I could see it in his face. He remembered the song. You know, it was like a piece of his life. And he, when he sang it, I mean, you'll hear it. When he sings, it's just, it's not just, oh, wow, that's Willie Nelson. It's just very soulful. And um, so I was really blessed to have him sing with me. And, and of course, Alison Krauss, see, I met her once because, you know, you have to do like Grammys or this or that, and I saw her once and they said, hey, that was really great track, such great talent, you know. And then, of course, we started, when I came down here, I like met all these different people, and one of the guys was this guy, Buddy, who I don't know, he's not good with last names, but he's a great producer, and he works with everybody, <coughs> and he 
was working with Allison and said, hey, I've met Cindy, she's down here, she's in the studio with Tony, and blah, 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 blah. So we started texting, and I said, hey, big fan, can you, do you want to sing on my record? And she was like, oh, wow, sure, I'm so flattered. And I was like, didn't. So she came and she, she sang, and you know, of course, she sings like an angel. She could sing her own book, and it would be mesmerizing, you know, because of her voice. And then we were talking, and see, I wanted to do this song, Cowboy Sweetheart, because <coughs> for two reasons. You know, the history of women is, I mean, I know, I'm, I'm talking about the history that I know talking to my mother and my grandmother and her mother and her mother. At first, especially the turn of the century or in the 1800s, you didn't get education. The education you got was how to cook and clean, which did it, being from a Sicilian family, they were still spreading that around. You know, like I was going to cook and clean. And I said to myself, for you, maybe. You know, I, I do that. Of course, you can do that for the rest of your life. Um, the way it was always presented was you weren't going to really do this or that, you know. And when I heard Cowboy Sweetheart, you know, what women did after a while, I guess, was they married the guy that did the thing that they wanted to do or as close as they could get to it because they could. And when I heard that, I, you know, because it's twofold. You laugh a little because she says she wants to be a cowboy sweetheart and then never mentions the guy again. You know, she'd rather sleep, you know, pillow her head and eat the sleep in her. So basically she's saying she wants to sleep with the cows but not him because he wasn't even in the equation. So I started laughing. I thought, oh, okay. And so for two reasons I wanted to do that. And then there was great yodel. And I was thinking, oh, yeah, I could yodel, you know. And then I was told, well, yeah, we'll get you a teacher. And, you know, Peter Gabriel learned how to yodel in three days. And I thought, mm, okay, you know, so I tried. And, of course, I can yodel like that in three days. You can't. That takes a lifetime. So I remembered that Jewel said she yodeled, you know, the Jewel. So... I asked Allison if she might know Jewel, and she said yes, she had this number, so I texted Jewel, and I said, hi, is this Jewel? This is Cindy Lomberg, big fan, you know, if this isn't Jewel, well, then just chalk it up as another crazy text, you know, and then she texted back and said, yes, this is Jewel, you know, and I said, do you still yodel? And she said, well, Yes, and that's an unusual question, but okay. And I said, well, I'm doing this thing, and blah, blah, blah. So she came down and yodeled. It's got to be my one of my favorite parts of the whole album, just when I said, take it, Jewel, you know, and she starts yodeling, like, incredibly. Anyway, maybe that's the long and short of this record. I don't know. I wanted to do this... I wanted to do a project with Seymour Stein. I did. I've been coming down to Nashville for many, many years to make music, just not inside the city, and not the kind of you know record that I made. I was busy working on you know dance music because there's a lot of other music that goes on in Nashville besides you know country and. I've always been a bit of an outsider, so when I did this, I I didn't, you know, do this as, okay, now I'm golden country, you know, because I'm from New York City and I have a French accent, it's not gonna work, you know, here. But um, I was really, really pleased and blessed, I think, to work with everyone. The musicians on this album are great. You guys, should cherish this music community that you have. There are not many places in our country that have a music community anymore, but this place is a music community, and it was kind of great to be part
part of it and work among you for the time that I did. And I had a great time, and I'm hoping to make some other music down here with a few friends. And I guess that is the long and short of it now, mostly the long. Any questions? Adam? Do you, um, after the album comes out, do you have dreams of playing the Grand Ole Opry? <laughs> I, you know, when I was uh, when I was here in '84, I walked the streets, you know, in disguise, of course. But I saw the old Grand Ole Opry and all the pictures on the outside. And of course, as a kid, I always saw Minnie Pearl, you know, and loved her. And so, you know, <clears throat> hell yeah, I'd like to. You know, sad it's not in the same place. Because I think as a singer, there's so many voices that rise up to the rafters. And I think the sound just stays there and sweetens all the other sounds that come along. And I think that as a singer, when you're standing on a stage, you kind of feel all that. So it's kind of, it would be cool. Maybe I'll get a little hat with a tick. I'm not sure. <laughs> Well, I am. I'm touring the album, and I'm going to play the rhyme, and that's the first gig. So I'm pretty excited about that. And I'm going to tour with Boy George six days with Boy George. It's going to be fun. You know, now he has a good country voice. He has a really good voice. Well. When did you know that you wanted to finally get a country uh, album or an album with a country feel? Um. Well, these are all old country classics, you know. Um, well, when I started talking to Seymour uh, Stein, there were actually two different projects, and this was one of them. And I thought that this one would suit me better, because the other one might have dealt with some, you know, foreign languages. I could see that you are bilingual, which is a great gift. I'm not. So I would have to be doing it all phonetically, and I just thought, you know, what about English? That would work. <laughs> <laughs> so Mick Lambert will be performing in Cuba March 25th. Will you be interested in going down and do a concert now that the relations between the two countries have been established? Who's going down? Cuba. No, who's going Mick to? Mick Jagger. <gasps> really? Oh. Alone? <laughs> Down with the Rolling Stones? <laughs> that would be a riot. The Rolling Stones? Wow. Yeah. Um, I don't know. Sure. I've always wanted to see it. You know, Come remember down. the We're Buena Vista there. Social Club? Mm -hmm. I used to listen to that a lot. Not that <clears> I understood exactly <throat> what was going on, but kind of, you know. Well, you know, I didn't know English when I heard you on the radio, but I love you then. <laughs> Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. You teamed up with uh, Willie Nelson on his Gershwin tribute record. Yeah, that was the deal. Yeah. Did I'm you thinking. Oh yeah, that's a stretch. When? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. Nobody ever asked me to sing on their record. Yeah. Um, that came out, you know, just in February. Did you do your record first? Uh, team up with him and do that duet, or did did you <coughs> do his first? I had to get a lot of tracks done and then after he left I went into his studio into a different studio at um, the Sound Emporium and did his track <coughs> well no no they just brought it over because it was at the end of the day so I ended the session and did his song so you know it was uh, it was pretty interesting because you know when they said a Gershwin song, so I'm thinking, and then when they said it's, um, <coughs> let's call the whole thing off, you know, you say potato, I say potato, <coughs> I'm thinking, oh, does that have something to do with my accent, <laughs> you know, um, so it kind of did, made it a little like the jazz that I studied, you know, because for a while in jazz, you always, you know, there's the masters, and Ella Fitzgerald is one of them, so, and Louis Armstrong, and 
when I was growing up, I was listening to Willie Armstrong and Fats Waller, and they always commented while they sang. So I put a little of that in, you know, I allowed myself to, you know, use my accent, and then sang what I thought would be appropriate for a Gershwin song. And I, I think it worked out. I mean, and then I got to sing with him uh, live for his, um, they honored him in Washington. And it was pretty interesting, you know. It was, uh, it was kind of great. He's very in the moment, which is very jazz. You know. Is that the first time you performed with him, was in Washington? That's great. Cindy? Um, being a master of reinvention, is there any fear or hesitation when going into like a new project? Because you could sing anything. So says you. I don't know. And Seymour <laughs> said that. And I was like, well, um, you know, it was just that I felt like I missed out on stuff. And, you know, the whole job of becoming famous is it could take away from what you might want to do musically. And since, you know, since 80, 1989, after 1989, <laughs> when I kind of went to hell in a handbag, I figured it didn't matter. And I could do what I love to do. And I could be myself. And I don't think that worrying about, you gotta try. You know, it's always sink or swim for me anyway. And I didn't know when I was singing with those guys, the first song, I stunk. I was awful, I thought. But I, was, I felt that because I couldn't connect with them, and I had to understand how I was going to connect with them. And, uh, <coughs> you know, I worry every time. I never, I never think I have qualifications. But then I think, well, if you were busy counting your qualifications, you would never try anything, you know? So I keep trying. I've been fortunate that my fans, <coughs> God bless them, I dragged those poor things with me <laughs> through hill and dale, and they still follow, which is which is wonderful of them. And um, you know, how are you gonna know what you could do if you never try something new? You know, that's how I'm thinking. Yeah, you might fall on your butt, but if you don't try, you don't know, and you won't grow. That's what I'm thinking. Does that answer your question? Yes, that was great. Okay. Cindy? Yeah. Right here in the back. You talked about um, performing <coughs> with Boy George. Does that mean Boy George on the show is going to take some of the Vince parts on the music? You know, <laughs> I'm trying to talk him into that. I don't know if he's going for it. You know, we're going to do a duet, but, you know, I thought that would be pretty funny. But I have no idea what he's, you know, what he's going to do. It, it has to speak to him. You know, he might come up with some obscure thing, you know. It'll be fine. I would love for him to do that, because that's very funny. But, um, you know, you gotta see. He's a funny guy. Over here. Speaking of collaborations, I know Steven Tyler's recently gone country. I think it would be amazing to see you two perform together. Do you think that's a possibility? Never thought of that, but everything's a possibility. Y'all got awesome hair. Y'all would just totally oh, awesome. Awesome. Yeah. 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 awesome on stage. Well, yeah. <laughs> and also, real quick, a friend of mine, he's a close friend of mine, it's a producer, he said um, your song Girls Just Want to Have Fun, that his godmother, Ellie Greenwich. Ellie, sang Ellie Greenwich. Greenwich, sorry. She sang background. Yeah. She wrote that part. Girls, they want, want to have fun. And okay. she said to me, Sin, use your accent. I said, what accent? <laughs> no, but, you know, that's what we, yeah, in a stairwell we did it. That's amazing. She was actually, um, you know, I would talk to her occasionally when I had a second, but she was um, a lot of the reasons that I pushed to do stuff was because of her. Really? She told me her story, and I guess on the shoulders of the older artist, you grow, but because
because of her story. And I made sure that I was credited. I always fought to write. I wanted to be credited. And I wanted to produce and be credited because Ellie Greenwich produced a lot of stuff and was a credit. So she was a she was really a very very talented woman. Awesome. Time for one more question. Beth, did you have one? Yeah, I was gonna ask you, Cindy, about um, the album title, Detour. Did you come up with the song first or the title first? How did you come up with that? No, I wanted to do Detour, but you know, Seema sent files and files and files, right? And then there were publishing companies that started to send cases of CDs over. You know, so I was like, you know, but I listened and I listened and I really loved the idea of detour. And I just loved the Patty Page version. And detour came first, the song. And then, you know, I was thinking, oh my God, what are you gonna call the album? What are they, how are they gonna know what it is? And they're not gonna know it's country, you know. Cause when I did the blues album, the record company president kept going to me, it was a small indie label, and he's saying, you know, you have to tell them what it is in the title. I said, well, it's a blues album. But it's a Memphis, it's from Memphis. And he, I said, oh, how about Memphis blues? So it's Memphis blues, so people know. Then I'm thinking, what are you gonna call it, Nashville? I was like, hmm. And I was thinking, it's another detour, son. It's yet another detour. And then I started to get all the crazy images in my head with the sign and the road and the, you know. And um, I'm, I'm really happy to be on Sire. I always wanted to be on Sire. And maybe it's 20 years later, but it, better late than never, you know. So yeah, I thought a detour. It's another detour. And in life, there's many detours. But sometimes they're not bad to take. This was a good one. Thank you very much. All right, well, thank you. And okay, that was the long and short, mostly the long, <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, anyway, thanks. So